meeting is being recorded. Well, hello, this is Jeff Gadiosi, and it's another edition of The Blues Fix here on MisplacedStraws.com. And my guests today are about to release a great record of some pretty obscure blues covers that they really make their own. The record is out April 29th. It's from the band is called Bonham Bullock. And joining us today are Peter Bullock and Deborah Bonham. Welcome. Hey, Hello. Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Hello. Good to see you. Hello, everyone. So yeah. let's kind of start off with this record. First of all, how did the two of you get together to put this together? Because you both have had great careers for quite a while now. Yeah, well. Well, I did that. well we, we've uh, we've made three albums together uh, previously uh, under the name Deborah Bonham or Deborah Bonham Band, and that's what we've been touring for the last twenty five years probably. Uh, that this this one, um, I, I don't know that the record company and us and everybody decided to, to give to give the band a, a better sort of idea of being a band that with with us sort of guitar feature girls. <laughs> Singer name for those who haven't heard us. It was all about you. <laughs> it was all about me. So, so I'm I'm basically just <laughs> edging. Out. I'm edging her out. It'll be the Peter Bullock band next year. For the next <laughs> 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 now that that was the idea. I, I don't know. I guess like Tavesi, Chuck Stewart, you know that kind of thing, and mm -hmm. uh, all, all, all that. And just just yeah. to give give kind of an idea of it being a band and there's a guitar in it well, rather than just a girl singer. I think also, you know, I, I felt for quite a long time that it should have been a band. Uh, it should be a band name because we've always been a band. I mean, we've been together years and years. Mm -hmm. And then after the we when we came to America in 2018 and, and Paul Rogers picked Pete to be the guitarist in his band and the rest of the band. So Jared Lewis keyboard, Richard Newman on drums and uh, Ian Rowley on bass. They, you know, it, it just made sense for it. The next project that's when quarter valley records saw us and sort of said well we'd like to do something with you which was great at this point to have a record company really interested in doing something new with us then it just made total sense to me for it to be a band name and to do a, a different project from me just uh from us writing our own material so it sort of came around that way didn't it pete and because yeah, you were they, they, they kind of, a star on that tour you know yeah <laughs> they kind of mentioned that you know that, that you know, blues guitarist magazines might not interview a girl singer. Rather, they, so, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but that's not the only reason. Come on. I mean, I, I'd already said to you, I want this to be a band because it is. If people think they're just coming to see just Deborah Bonham, they're not. They're coming to see this incredible backside kicking, unbelievable swaggered band, you know. I mean, it is a brilliant band. Just, just to have that endorsement for Paul Rogers says it all. So to me, it was just, it, the time was right. The time was right now. Yeah, and I, I really enjoy the record. And what I love about a record like this is if you are a deep blues fan, you may remember some of these songs and it'll bring back the memories of them. If you're a casual fan, this isn't the stuff that you would hear on the radio all the time. So yeah. your version sort of provide a history that gets into it. How did you guys decide which songs you were going to cover? Well, um, uh, we had a bunch of friends that uh, helped. Uh, uh, well, De Deborah May and Lee and then a bunch of friends helped contribute. We ended up we ended up with a pile of about 100 songs at least. Uh, through suggestions and stuff that we went through and uh, and then it was finally whittled down to the 13 that we did so by whittling down from 100 to 13 there's there's like no there, there doesn't seem to be any sort of album fillers it mm. seems to be ev everyone in my book has uh, got got the most incredible attention from us to to re really work it hard and, and Deborah's production and what it sort of brought out of us all so the, the 13 songs there isn't a filler there everyone I, I can't pick a favourite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much on the money. It, it's sort of um, friends, exactly what he said. There was some, some friends, some that I wanted to do, and there was a, about 100 gathered. And it wasn't, it wasn't a really difficult process, actually, picking the songs, because I know what I can do. I know what I can sing, and I know what the band can play. Um, so it... it you know, the, they just jumped out. Those are the ones that there was no struggle of, yeah, but I want to do that one. I want to do mm -hmm. these just came. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, the struggle and pushing us out of our comfort zone was when we went to do them to bring our own interpretation, to bring our heart and soul to it. So, yeah, that weighed heavy and that really did stretch us, you know, pushed us right out there. But it was great. I mean, we were, we were due for a good old stretch, you know, so, so it's been great, you know. It's, it's almost like if you if you do your own songs, which all our albums have been our own mm. pen songs, it's almost like that appears easy now compared to doing other people's yeah. songs. But we weren't, <laughs> well, yeah. we, we weren't yeah, in comparison because we weren't expecting it to be this or to put in so much thought and love and emotion. And I mean, this, this this these 13 tracks really quite tore it out of us and tore it out of Deborah and the production and stuff. They got so, such a lot of attention that, because we were so aware of it being somebody else's song and yeah, having been absolutely. done before we had, create, we had to create know, something different uh, and, and, and giving the respect you know mm -hmm. keeping the, the integrity of the original song was up uh, for me it was just the most important and for, and for pete because you know when you take on albert king <laughs> you gotta mean it you know it's albert king you can't just go in half-hearted on that you've mm -hmm. got to really mean it and you can't just copy him because Albert King is the best of Albert King. Mm. So it was really, um, yeah, it was a challenge, but it was a great one because we, we realised how far we can stretch ourselves, you know, and how we've never really done that on such a scale before. We've, we've done interpretations of other people's songs occasionally on, on each album. There's been one maybe, um, but we've never done it on this scale and I've never fully produced. So it was out of our comfort zone, but gosh, am I glad we did it, you know, because it's it's really, it, it's made us really grow as as musicians and producers, I think. And funny I mean, enough, the, the 13 songs seem to sound like they've all come from the same camp, yeah, the same band, yeah, which is, uh, that was kind of a, a shock. No, it was a deliberate production on Deborah's. I would say that was my production. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't shocked at all. <laughs> no, it was delivered. Honestly, well, it's, I've heard that a lot from artists I've interviewed that have done covers records that it, it's harder than when you're writing your own because you're yeah. trying to stay oh. true to the original, but you're trying to make it your own and you're That's trying it. to give them all a, a similar feel so that the record flows. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, that, that's it. That's interesting. You've heard that before because mm -hmm. we, we haven't read any, anybody say that before. Mm -hmm. So that's that's great that yeah. we're. I think it's comforting it, that we're not the only ones that felt that way. I think the difference with us is that, you know, from, from the get-go, we weren't going to do an out-and-out out straightforward blues record. That was just a no-no because um, for me, I, you know, it's been done so many times and I just didn't want to do all of those classics and do it and, and do straight copies, you know. So... We did the twist from the beginning by picking some songs that really are rooted in blues, but but also very soulful, you know, and 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 then added some, some rock to it, a bit of progressive rock as well, and it, you know, but but the ultimate thing is the blues. But I think just choosing um, songs that aren't just the the you know the the ones that everybody's picked before. That was slightly the, the difference, different uh, approach that we took. And uh, we wanted to keep the integrity of the song and the respect for the, these amazing artists that we love so much, you know. But we didn't want to copy it. We wanted to bring us to it. Because if you don't bring yourself to it, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not meaning it. You have to bring yourself. You have to bring your heart and soul and your own interpretation, just like Joe Cocker did with little help from my friends, you know. I mean, that for me is the benchmark of all covers mm. to take little help from my friends, Ringo Starr and the Beatles, and do Joe Cocker. I mean, he, he made it Joe Cocker. Or, or can I add another one there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that, uh, don't Pass Me By, Georgia Satellites, doing another Ringo to Star <laughs> song. Yeah. Yeah. That is, a, yeah, that yeah. is another case of uh, little help from my friends being... <laughs> yeah, maybe, um, maybe only those two are better than the originals. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying whether it's better than the original or not. What I'm saying no, is, no, no, no. it's so far different. And what Joe Cocker did was, when he sang it, he meant that. Yeah. He meant every inch of it, and and he did it in a style that's him. That soul blues rock, you know, and that 
that's really where we were aiming with this album. Well, where I was aiming. I just didn't tell the band about that. I just let them find it. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the kind of blues, rock and soul of the late 60s and 70s, it kind yeah. of spots into that kind of... That, that, yeah. that's, what's, that's what's in our blood, so it, it came yeah. kind of... Absolutely. It yeah, and it, I think... You know, Peter had mentioned that he doesn't have a favorite on the record. I do. Mm. Um, my the one that really stood out to me because it's one of my favorite songs ever is "Bleeding Muddy Water" from ah. the late wow. Mark Lan again. Yeah, and it yeah. becomes so poignant now because we lost Mark. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. what does that song mean to you guys now? Is you know, since he's passed, since you've recorded it. It gave me the, the shivers, really. I mean, it gave me the shivers when we did it because I just knew there was a moment in the studio where I was sat with the engineer on my own, with the engineer, and I just knew. I knew we'd got it right on that, you know, on, when the song was playing back, I just thought I, I went goosebumps and mm -hmm. I knew we'd got it right. And um, I was so excited to, to, to get in touch with him. I was, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to... Get, find how I can get hold of Mark Lanigan because I really want to play him this. Because I think he's quite an underrated singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's big as the Screaming Trees vocalist. Mm -hmm. But as a singer-songwriter, the guy's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite underrated how great he was. Um, so I thought, I've got to let him know, you know. And then he passed away and... Uh, no, it was, it, it, was, it was shocking, you know. It was, it was so, so very, very sad. Because the song, the lyrics in the song, and because they resonate with everything about the Mississippi, and also uh, it resonates with Led Zeppelin's When the Levee Breaks, you know. So it's got all of that going on in it. So it just for me, it was just a, as soon as I heard it from his Blues Funeral album, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. We could we can have a go at this one, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you mentioned Zeppelin and When the Levee Breaks, and, you know, People may recognize your name, Deborah. You're the sister of late Zeppelin drummer John Bonham. And, you know, we mentioned losing Mark Lanigan. We recently lost Taylor Hawkins. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we as fans feel that loss and, and, you know, feel that it's shared with the world. But as someone who's gone through it with your family, mm -hmm. is it? harder or easier to grieve such a momentous loss when the world is doing it with you? I, that's a, it's a, it's a great question and it's a tough one because I've lost both my brothers, mm -hmm. um, John and Michael. Um, and Michael was only 49. So, and I don't know, the grief is equal. Um, it really is equal. I think it, you never, you never, you, you, ne you never can bury, uh, you, you can never totally bury somebody who's completely that famous because mm -hmm. there's always something. To, to, to us, he's, John's almost constantly alive because there'll be a new remastered album or there'll be a film or there'll be a book and da 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 da. And, you know, and I'm always talking about it. And I'll be honest with you, it, you know. After you know a few weeks of doing quite a few interviews, sometimes I have a little breakdown because it gets quite emotional talking about him, you know, because it's still there and it still hurts. Um, what I found was when we went out and played live, and I'd written a song called "The Old Hide" from our old Hide album. Um, the old Hide was the farm that John bought and, and built with my dad just after like Led Zeppelin II, I think. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place and my uh, sister-in-law still lives there. And I wrote this song about it. And what I found was when I went out and sang it, and it was all about the farm, it was about John and dad and losing them. Michael hadn't passed then, um, but it was all about that. But it was a song, you know, to quote, <laughs> to quote a famous expression from a Mr. Plant, it was a song of hope, you know. <laughs> <laughs> of hope because you know I'd like to think I, I will see them again mm -hmm. and it's about it, it's about you know they've gone but they're never really gone mm -hmm. so we've got to keep going and do our best in life as much as we can and when I sang that out on the stage I was amazed at the amount of people I met afterwards at the merch table or, you know meet and greets or whatever that had all gone through so much stuff so I found it really cathartic then that music 
um, it wasn't so much that everybody else was grieving about John, it was about how many people just were going through what I went through on every level. Um, and then you realize you're not alone. So in that way, yeah, um, it, it worked for me. Yeah, I found it cathartic. Mm -hmm. Um, but Pete's been through the same thing. He lost his his wonderful uncle, who's only a few years older than him. Um, just so before the like brothers. Yeah, yeah you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've you've recently lost him, haven't you? And it, and mm -hmm. and and he's Paul Paul Rowan. His name. He was a big noise in Belfast. So whenever Pete goes back to Belfast, it's a different scale to John. Of course, mm -hmm. I mean John's like. Mm -hmm. You know, worldwide mega star. Worldwide, mm -hmm. but Paul, it's the same thing in. in fast wide. Right? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's the same thing. So, how would you? What would you say about that question, Pete? Do you find it? Do you find it helpful that so many people in Belfast? Well, I would say when 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 Paul died, who's who's a local hero, my uncle Paul, three years older than me, guitarist. Uh, he sort of we we played since we were I don't know I was seven years old he was mm -hmm. ten years old so guitar, that's why you start playing the guitar wasn't it yeah learning the guitar together and stuff so and and, and finding our, our sort of his big sister's records or babysitter's records you know which would be the stones and uh free which hence why I ended up mm -hmm. such a sort of free fan and uh, how that sort of sat in my playing and then uh, and bad company and stuff like that so we 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 do all that together all the way through. And then he, he ended up going a little bit sort of punky and stuff whenever I left and moved over to England. And uh, so he, he had a bit of success with a sort of glam punk band. And uh, so I, I'd come back every after he died. We, we had a lovely big uh, sort of <clears throat> after, after funeral wake and stuff for him. And, and it was just all his band friends and lots of other local bands and, and we all played his songs and we set the stage up. And, and I find it actually helpful, that public grief. Mm -hmm. But but what I also find was I wasn't actually grieving. I was having a party. And it was, it was after it all shut down and the next day, yeah. the grief set in whenever I was on my own again. But at yeah. that time, it was, like, it was almost like he was the only one missing at this great party or this great gig. Yeah. And you just assumed he was there because it was so and, great. And unfortunately, that does still happen. And, and as much as I know how much the world misses uh, John and how much the Belfast and, and all of his dear friends miss Paul and my brother Michael, I mean, his funeral was incredible. He, there was people lining up in the streets because everybody loved him in his hometown of Redditch. So, you know, you, you do take up that on board, but... Uh, then there'll be those moments where you just, you know, you think about them and the, you you just want them back and, and it's not possible. And that's part of life. Mm. And, um, and you know, we just have to get along with that mm. and uh, carry on. And, you know, kind of continuing with that a little bit over the years, Deborah, you've played a lot with your nephew, Jason on drums mm. and Robert Plant has sort of been a mentor to you over the years. If, do you have any kind of ongoing relationship with Robert, Jimmy, and John Paul Jones at all, or is it with Robert, the distance? No, with Robert, definitely. He's he's one of my closest friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Pete's. Uh, we're very close with him. He's like a big brother, really. Um, and yeah, I mean, without a doubt, his musical um, it, it, knowledge is just fantastic you know he's 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 incredible i love talking to him about you know music and we sit for ages and he, he'll play stuff and he'll suddenly you know send me an album like for my birthday that i've never heard of the guy and i put it on and it's absolutely amazing a guy called uh, robert finley absolutely blew me away so he's still you know he knows music and uh, him and pete will sit and play uh um Oh, who's your favourite guy? He wears a gold ring oh, on her finger. <laughs> and it's mine. I'm going to call him Guy Ritchie, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, that... So they will, you know, he, he's, he's, yeah, he's very close. Jimmy, if I see him once a year, then mm. yeah, it's always lovely. Yeah. I haven't seen John Paul Jones for quite a while, mm. but when we were doing our... Um, John Bonham Memorial, um, we were raising money 
for the event because I'd already raised the money for the big bronze statue that we did. Um, we were raising the money for the event for Teenage Cancer Trust. And he jumped straight in there and, and was fantastic donating. It's a, a very nice amount of uh, money for them. So, you know, yeah. Michael Jones, uh, oh, lo lovely, beautiful, generous guy. Hmm. Yeah, they all are. They all are. All three of oh, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, they really are, you know, they're, 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 they're great guys. Hmm. So, yeah, I do see them. So bringing it back to Bonham Bullock, um, so the record's out April 29th. Um, I know there's still a lot of uncertainty in the world. Here in the U.S., things are opening up a little bit. Do you guys think you'll be able to get on the road at home? And do you foresee the chance of coming over to the U.S. to do any shows? Well, we, we go on the road here in the U.K. and Europe. Uh, we start on the 28th of April. Mm. So we're doing a bunch of shows and some nice theaters and stuff. And... Uh, and uh, then we, uh, and then a few festivals in Europe and the UK through the summer. We're just as, just as we speak, we're we're chatting to some sort of agents out in America that have shown some interest. So we'll hopefully, if oh, not by the so. end of this year, it'll I be out so. early next year. Hmm? I hope so. I, I hope really. Like it. Oh, I yeah. so <laughs> back to America, and you, of course, because you're really having having uh, withdrawal symptoms of the. Uh, 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 thing. What is it that you love? Well, the chicken wings and the uh, American <laughs> PLA. <Yeah. laughs> of I don't course. Know how to without them. <laughs> we, me and the band found our perfect diet. It was like you just ch chicken wings and you'd get. Uh... Oh, wait a minute. It wasn't you and the whole band. <laughs> Okay, it okay, you. it was, it was three, three of us, three sorry, we have two vegetarians in the band. <laughs> <laughs> That's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> Not the chicken wing place, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, you well, know, if we end up on a starving desert island, we're going to eat the vegetarians first. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully yeah. we'll get to see you guys here well, in the we're US. Desperate. Yeah. We're desperate to be there, you know, we had such a great time, we were there last in 2019 at the cutting room in new york mm -hmm. and then up to Daryl hall's place daryl's house which was just my favorite venue ever i live about oh. an hour and change from there love that venue oh, yeah, man. The, guy, the guy doing our sound was uh daryl hall's sound engineer as well so it was, uh, oh he was phenomenal wasn't he he was yeah. just so great it was a we, did, we did levin helms place as well while yeah. we were there yeah up in and woodstock then, and then Very we did nice. uh, Asprey Park, didn't we, in uh, New Jersey? Yeah. Mm. We did the, uh, oh, cracky, what was that club called? Stone Pony? No, yeah. it was the other one. Opposite it. Opposite Ooh. Stone Pony. Uh, House of the Independents. There, there's, it's changed oh. names, I believe. Yeah. Oh, damn, I yeah. forgot oh, what it was called. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big venue. before that, 20, 2018, we did the Stars Align tour with Jeff mm. Beck and Wilson and Paul Rogers doing a free sale. And De De Deborah opened up the shows, and then did uh, you just say they were doing a threesome? Uh, no, did I say <laughs> that? Yeah, I've got these yeah, what goes on tour stays on tour. Anyway, I get these photographs out of them. No, no. <laughs> I think you're going to have to rephrase that one, yeah. Pete. We can oh, edit that part. Yeah. I'm not really an Andy Fraser. So, that's, uh, <laughs> so <it's>, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we did that that tour. Deborah opened up the shows, Anne Wilson mm. and Jeff Beck and uh, Paul Rogers would switch the headlines each mm. night. So. Uh, so Deborah's band backed Paul Rogers every night as well. Mm. So we, we got to do all the free and bad company stuff. We, uh, then, especially as we had to go on after Jeff Beck. So that's <laughs> that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign of taking brave pills. Yeah, I had to go on in front of Anne Wilson. So mm. yeah, she sat, she sat at the side of the stage every night. While yeah, I was on yeah, in equal measure, she had to sing in front of Anne Wilson, and I had to play guitar in front mm. of Jeff Beck. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't have to make up your game, I can tell you. you I really, would imagine. When you're looking around, your heroes are stood there, you know, because I'm a yeah. player. Yeah. All, all, all of a sudden, I had to leave out my trademark bum notes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, well, we've been spending some time here today with Peter Bullock and Deborah Bonham. Uh, the band is called Bonham Bullock. 
The record is out everywhere on April 29th. And I can't thank you both enough. This has been a lot of fun. And thank we will you, definitely do this again when you guys come to the U.S. to tour. We would so love to. to. Yeah. yeah, we'd love to. Thank you so much. Thank Jeff. you both very much. Great. Thank you. Bye.